guest today is a professor emeritus of geology at Portland State University, where he just finished his 33rd year of teaching. He is also an author of multiple books, including Cataclysms on the Columbia, the Great Missoula Floods, which is what we spent most of this episode discussing. This is the second largest known Great Flood event, and it ripped through our region approximately 19,000 years ago and repeated itself upwards of 40 times. This episode is chock full of fantastic information. I am so grateful I got to spend some time with this intelligent guy, my friend, Scott Burns. Well, Scott, I appreciate you coming down here. I found you, and then I also found your book, Cataclysms on the Columbia, Great Missoula Floods, which you said is on its sixth pressing? Yeah, sixth printing right now. Sixth yeah. printing, okay. And... uh it originally came out in 2009. I went to the library. I rented it. I was uh, reading it and going through some things and was uh, excited to see some, some sections on the Dalles, Oregon, where I grew up. So a, a lot of this stuff is in my realm, in my childhood and everything. And I had the book ready to go last night, sitting on my ottoman, and then I walked out this morning and forgot it. <laughs> so I intended to bring it, but that didn't happen. Uh, but it's it's a great read so far. And so I don't usually start things this way, uh, but I kind of wanted to just give people a little audio and video snippet to watch just to kind of ground themselves in what we're going to talk about. So not trying to steal any of your thunder, but here is a video. Um, I believe it's from PBS. And so we'll just watch a couple minutes of it. Sounds good. We'll get into it. Joe here. I'm in the scablands of eastern Washington right now. And, well, that's a waterfall behind me. It's a pretty nice waterfall, but as waterfalls go, it's actually pretty average. Its height, the volume of water that falls over its face, they don't rank anywhere near the top 10 as waterfalls go. But this waterfall does hold one important record among all waterfalls. It was created in what is perhaps the largest flood to ever happen on planet Earth, at least that we know of. Whatever you're imagining as this flood, you need to think bigger, much, much bigger. Because the flood that created this and the entire landscape around us is bigger than anything that could happen on the planet today, by a long shot. Across what is today a dry and arid landscape, there are clues of an epic flood hidden in rocky scars and strange landforms, if you know how to read them. The pieces of this mystery are hard to make sense of on their own, but together they tell a story that's, well, almost impossible to believe. In fact, it took decades for scientists to finally accept that these cataclysmic events really did happen. And in the process, this story completely changed science, forcing geologists to totally rethink their ideas about the powerful forces and events that have shaped the Earth throughout deep time. This discovery also set the stage for other discoveries about other violent events that have shaped not only our planet, but others. Okay, I guess we'll stop there because that's a commercial. <laughs> okay. Uh, so lots of things to, to ask initially. A lot of these landscapes, like I said, are very familiar to me because I grew up in the Dalles and I'm familiar with the area. And so when you drive through the gorge and you see the, 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 the way that everything is cut into the, the, the banks, this makes a lot of sense that so much of that water could have come rushing through. And so do you, let's go back maybe to why it did what, what happened that caused this insane flood to tear through the, the countryside? Okay, and, and, and it's wonderful, and that was a great introduction. And I loved uh, the, the whole thing uh, with the Palouse Falls, et cetera. <clears throat> you know, I give a lot of talks on this a lot of the time. And when I, the story of the Missoula floods or the Ice Age floods, 
uh, is an incredible story for two reasons. And it was alluded to in the introduction, first of all, uh, because it changed how we think about geology. Uh, and the guy who came up with the story, J. Harlan Brest, went against the thinking of all of the geologists of the day. And But he, he read the landscape and he saw, you know, it sure seems to me like there were huge floods there. And, and he stuck to his guts, he stuck to his uh, data, and in the end, he outlived everybody. And so the story of the Missoula floods and the Ice Age floods is a story of how science works and how it doesn't. And then the story of what happened in the ice dam that created it. Uh, and, and then how it has affected 16,000 square miles in the Pacific Northwest. Uh, it is just an unbelievable story, and we invite people to come uh, from all over the world to see this. Uh, and so if we just go back, if you allow me to talk about J. Harlan Brents. And so he um, grew up in, or he actually grew up in Michigan, and his name was Harlan Bretz, but he grew up being known on the farm as Harley Bretz. He went to college. He went to Albion College, geology department. And then he went and got his PhD at the uh, University of Chicago. Uh, and when he handed in his PhD dissertation, uh, it was J. Harlan Bretz. And, uh, and, and so his PhD advisor said, you know, what are you doing with this? Why, what's this J? He said, it means nothing, but Harlan Bress isn't dignified enough for a person who has a PhD. Uh, and, and so he had a wee bit of an ego. Mm -hmm. Now he started out teaching at the University of Washington in the geology department. And in the summertime, he would take his graduate students and students to Eastern Washington, and they would map. And he, he kept on seeing these incredibly large uh, uh, river systems, but there's no water in them. And he saw these huge dunes uh, uh, of sediments that were deposited there. And we now know if we can uh, take a look at the wavelength of those dunes and back calculate using the size of the rocks, we can get velocities. And it, today, Vic Baker, one of the guys who eventually did this, you get velocities up to 50, 60, 70 miles an hour, which are just unheard of. These are what we call mega floods. And so Brett's mapped a lot of this eastern Washington, areas where uh, the, the soil had been ripped away. He called them the channel scab lands because that's what all of the farmers call, called this land because they couldn't grow anything. And so in 1922, he published a paper called the Spokane Flood, One Flood. And in that particular um, uh, paper, he said it looks like that there was a large flood that carved out all these great coolies and all of these incredible scab lands and created all these waterfalls in eastern Washington and then all the way down into the Columbia River, all the way out to the ocean. And he followed and he could see how high the water had come from this one flood. And he published that. But... Um, uh, he was going against the thinking of the day because the thinking was that catastrophic events were not possible in geology. So let me interrupt you. What, what did they think in 1922? Uh, it was the law of uniformitarianism, which goes right, way back to when geology was invented in Scotland in, in the early 1800s. And all landscapes are created very, very slowly over a long period of time from a whole bunch of erosion deposition uh, type of events that you have got. But catastrophic events are not. So in 1927, they, uh, uh, they invited, a, a Geological Society of America invited him to come to Washington, D.C. for a big meeting to explain his idea of the Missoula, uh, no, Spokane flood. They didn't tell him that they had lined up four major professors after him, actually the major hydrologists of the day, O.E. Meinzer, the father of American hydrology, and uh, four other guys who were all actually working for the U.S. Geological Survey. And they basically said, you're wrong, you're wrong, you're wrong. And he uh, basically gave up giving, uh, because he said, they said, where did the water come from? You don't have any idea. He said, well, maybe from the melting of the glacier. That's not good enough. It's a catastrophic event. You're going against uniformitarianism. And so he quit uh, the teaching at the University of Washington, went back to the University of Chicago, where he finished out his career. And and so, uh, but other people started putting things together during that period of time. And there was a guy uh, who was working and mapping up in uh, Montana, J.T. Pardee. He worked for the U.S. Geological Survey. When he retired in 1940, 
He presented a paper at the American Association for Advancement of Science, which was up in Seattle. Uh, and he said, you know, J. Harlan Bretz uh, said that there were these huge, this huge flood in eastern Washington creating the Channel Scablands. And he had mapped a lake up in uh, Montana that went through uh, right through Missoula. He called it Glacial Lake Missoula. And he said, if you go halfway between Glacial Lake Missoula and Spokane, Washington, uh, there is an area with these incredible ripple marks, fifty mi uh, five miles long, 50 feet high, about 100 of them, one after another. It sure looks to me like a huge flood came through. And, and, and everybody said, wow, maybe that's the source of the water for the floods for J. Harlan Brents. Mm -hmm. And so what happened with that, um, but he didn't come out and say it. He said, you put everything together. Well, two years later, he published a paper and he said the rapid em emptying of Glacial Lake Missoula. And then everybody said, wow, maybe Bretz is right, and all these other people are wrong. And then eventually, it got into the textbooks. When I learned my geology back in the 1960s, it was called the Spokane Flood, one flood at that time. Uh, and then, uh, then other people started getting involved. And a guy uh, named Brian Atwater was doing work up in northern Washington, and he found deposits, lots of deposits uh, of lake deposits and then catastrophic events with gravels, cobbles, and things like this, and then more lake deposits. And he added them up, and there were 89. And he said maybe th uh, this was uh, G Glacial Lake Columbia, which is from Spokane all the way over to the uh, bottom of the Okanagan. You say 89 as in 89 floods? A 89 floods. Biggest one being the first. Uh, and then um, uh, and then we had thought that uh, up in the very – that skinny part of Idaho – which is the Ponderay Valley. There were one, this was in the tail end of the glacial period. Uh, and the, the glacier was advancing and it went all the way down and blocked the major river, empty, uh, draining uh, eastern or uh, western uh, Montana mm -hmm. called the Clark Fork River. And it, it was uh, 2,200 feet high, three space needles, one on top of another on top of another. And it created a lake that went all the way back to Missoula, Montana. If you go to Missoula, there's the big M up on the, on the side of the hill. But you, if you look up and down the valley, you can see all of the old beaches mm -hmm. from this glacial lake, Missoula. And the highest one was from the highest lake. Uh, and, and then what happened was the ice, after the ice dam broke, all the water came out, it took three days for all of that water to come out, go down through Spokane, across eastern Washington, scour out all of the coolies and the, the large coolies, uh, and then the Channel Scablands. All that water got back into the Columbia River at Wallula Gap, which is where the river now crosses from Washington into Oregon, came down the Columbia Gorge all the way to Portland, hit the uh, West Hills of Portland, Tualatin Mountains, some of it went directly out into the ocean. Some of it went through Lake Oswego, scouring out Lake Oswego, filling up the whole uh, Tualatin Valley. And the rest of it went down between Oregon City and West Lynn and filled up the uh, Willamette Valley all the way down to uh, Eugene. And then we had a lake here for a week, week and a half, and then all that water went right back out into the ocean. The ice dam reformed. Uh, the lake filled up. But remember, the ice was getting let lower and lower. This was the tail end of the ice age. And so each lake was less and less and less. And then the, you had another flood. The ice dam broke, uh, another flood, and it was not quite as big as the last one. And so Brian Atwater counted up 89. Now, another guy who is right across the river, Richard Waite, uh, he works with also with the U.S. Geological Survey. He had been working up in the Walla Walla area, and he was having lunch. Uh, and, and there is a canyon that they call Burlingame Canyon. And in it, you can see all these layers, one after another after another. Uh, and this whole canyon was uh, cut because a irrigation canal broke. All that water went out and carved out this area as showing all of the different beds. So he went and looked at each of these beds, and there's sand on the bottom, silt on the top, sand on the bottom, silt on the top. Those are what we call graded beds. And he said, maybe each one of those is a flood. Uh, and then as the flood waters came down, the water went up into the side valleys, it containing a lot of sand, silt, and clay. And then uh, the sand came out first, and then the silt last. Uh, and he counted them up, and he got 40. 
And so he published a paper uh, in 1982, and 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 he called, uh, and he basically said there were 40 floods. And so we have similar deposits here in Portland, down the Willamette Valley. So we say 40 floods made it here to Portland, made it to Walla Walla. But then the later ones, up to 89 plus, because we didn't get to the bottom of it at Brian Atwater's site, we had. So we believe that we had 89 plus of these huge mega floods. Now, was it the biggest flood in the world? We found one in Russia, which was bigger. And hmm. you can, and Vic Baker, who is the guy, he, we both did our PhDs at the University of Colorado. He is a paleohydrologist. You go out and look at the size of the valleys, how high the, high the water was here. You put the water back in, based on the slope gradient, you can figure out velocities, power functions, and all of this. And he also studied this in Altai, Russia. And, um, and so we now think it's the second largest flood recorded on the face of the earth, that first flood, and then each one afterwards got less and less and less. But these floods, they had to have been pretty common, right? Over, no. the, over the course of, of the earth's history? It seems like they would happen... Yeah, what, uh, of the top 11 floods that geologists have recorded, all of them are ice dams. And so it formed during the glacial periods. Uh -huh. And so the, the last major, major glacial period that we have had started about 2.8 million years ago. We call it the Quaternary. Before that, things were much, much warmer. Now, we did have periods like uh, three billion, uh, 2 billion years ago, Snowball Earth, uh, 1 billion years ago, when the whole Earth was covered by ice. But, but that's so uh, long ago that none of those records of those floods are around. So in more recent times, like the last 50 million years, uh, these are the, the biggest floods that we have got. And this one that happened in Missoula, the Missoula flood, was approximately how long ago? Uh, so between fifteen and eighteen thousand years ago. Okay, and so from possibly eighteen thousand years ago to when there were eighty nine floods. So they started uh, um, eighteen thousand years ago. Actually, we now push it back to about nineteen thousand years because we have other dating techniques that we're using on some of the exposed rocks and things like that. But uh, Richard Waite uh, dated everything on those those layers, those forty layers, and you find a little piece of a pine cone or a little uh, some piece of wood or something like that in the layer, and you record which layer it is and you date it using uh, radiocarbon. Dating. Wow. And and so he, so he got he put together a very very good record between fifteen and eighteen thousand years, and now we're pushing it back maybe nineteen thousand. Now we have also found similar deposits all over eastern Washington that have soils on them uh, uh, that are what we call caliche calcium carbonate, and the gravels they're obviously flood gravels that are there, but they're all cemented together by this Mother Nature's cement uh, caliche. But it's too old for radiocarbon dating, so we have to use other dating techniques uh, that we uranium thorium dating uh, that we use in the Caliche, and so we push the uh, Missoula floods or similar types of floods. In my book, I call them uh, uh, ancient cataclysmic floods. We don't know if they came out of Glacial Lake Missoula or the Okanagan or uh, the Ponderay Valley. Uh, and so we believe that they're, uh, we're having a big field trip next summer to explore some of these older deposits and put together a better story. The older they are, the, the, the newer, younger floods have wiped away a lot of the deposits. And so there are sure. only just a few places where we find these. So the, the story on these Ice Age floods, we call them all the Ice Age floods, the old, older ones, the ancient cataclysmic floods, the younger ones, the Missoula floods, fifteen to 18,000 years ago. But they have, uh, they have just scoured out the Pacific Northwest in Portland. I mean, our whole topography that we have here is all a result of the Missoula floods and then a set of volcanoes called the Boring Lavas that started um, about 2 million years ago, ended uh, 55,000 years ago. Our youngest volcano in Portland is Rocky Butte. Uh, that's 92,000 years old. And then uh, the next oldest one uh, is uh, Mount uh, Tabor. 206,000. And then the next youngest ones are right above Cedar Hills. Well, and when you're dating them, you're saying the last time they erupted? Yeah, yeah yes. And, okay. and, and, and those are plus or minus 1,000 years, 2,000 years. We use uh, radiometric dating uh, so of does, the minerals. Does that make Mount St. Helens the youngest? Well, and Mount St. Helens is not in Portland. 
and is not in the Portland area. I so see. it was focusing at, yeah. So Mount St. Helens, May 18th uh, of 1980, it erupted, and then it had many other eruptions. So. How old is Mount Hood? So the youngest eruption up on Mount Hood uh, was um, about uh, um, year 1700. Really? Yeah, and then before that, it was 1,900 years ago. Uh, if you ever have skied up at Mount Hood, you look up, there's a big bowl above Timberline Lodge. That was the eruption there. That was uh, 1,500 years ago. Formed the whole delta uh, out there in Troutdale. Uh, and then, uh, and then we also had the one in 1700, 1786, uh, and that was the old Made Flats eruption. Uh, but it sent uh, uh, huge what we call lahars or muddy debris flows down the, all of the major river, including what we call the Sandy River. Lewis and Clark, when they came through, as they were the core of discovery, they camped out there. And they named that river the Quicksand River because every time they tried to go down and get water out of the river, they would sink in. Why? Because that it had just erupted just uh, a few years before that, and that was the 1711 uh, uh, or 1786 eruption that they wow. had out there. Uh, and and so Mount Hood its eruption was not too long before Lewis and Clark. Uh huh. Wow. Okay. So the the thing I want to go back because I was thinking about it when you're talking about it. When this monumental flood happened, and the way that they explain it in this video, which was cool, they compared it to Game of Thrones. You ever seen Game of Thrones? Mm-hmm. Okay. They said it's the, the equivalent of the 2,000-foot uh, the um, ice wall you know, that separates everything. And that basically, over time, developed a little crack, and then all of a sudden, it just burst through, and everything came shooting down. And the the... Speed of the water was in excess of 80 miles an hour? Uh, up to that. And Vic Baker is the guy that uh, has calculated all that, the professor at the University of Arizona. And his, uh, his uh, one of his graduate students, Jim O'Connor, who's here in Portland. He works for the U.S. Geological Survey. He's also a paleohydrologist. Uh, and, and he has verified all of these things. So what we do as geologists, we go out in the field, see the basin, see the size of the river, and then figure out how high the water was. Then you can, then you look at the slope gradients and you can back calculate the velocities that you have got. Uh, and they're amazing. I mean, these, we call these mega floods. We have, humans have never seen these. I mean, these are way, well, <laughs> except the early Native Americans probably did see that. And I, in my talks, a lot of people say, you know, was anybody around? Yes, uh, there, uh, because the oldest archaeological sites that we have in Oregon go back to 26, 30,000 years ago, and these floods were 15 to 18,000. So where would all of the Native Americans be? They would be following the salmon coming up the river. So all of those sites on the Columbia River would have been wiped out by all of the floods. Uh, and, uh, and, and so we don't have any records of humans being around there, but other places in the Pacific Northwest, we did. Yeah. Cause you're saying it wiped out whatever was there, including right. animals and everything. I mean, it, it picked up massive boulders yes. in Montana and took them to the Pacific ocean, right? Well, the, the, a few of them bounced along. All the big boulders that we see, out, see down here probably came as ice rafts. They were part of that ice dam that broke up every time. Uh, and, and, and so that was, those were glaciers that were going down the Ponderé Valley. Rocks were falling off of the mountains and onto the top. So we call them ice rafted boulders. Uh, the, the biggest one that we have here in Oregon is down just outside of Willamina. If you go from Portland down to the, uh, Lincoln City, City, there's a big sign that says glacial rock up on the side of the hill. It's at 400 feet elevation. That's how high the floodwaters got. Uh, the most famous ice rafted boulder that we have down here is uh, Tamanawas. Uh, it's the uh, meteorite, the world, the largest meteorite ever found in the United States. It was found uh, down in West Lynn. It, actually, Willamette, which is a suburb of West Lynn, at 400 feet elevation, the height of the floods. Uh, and, uh, and, and so it was on exposition in 1905 at the Lewis and Clark Exposition here in Portland. Now it is in the American Museum of Natural History in New York City. And you're saying it is native to Montana? No, it, it, was a, it was actually a meteorite that fell 
onto the glaciers up in Alaska. And then it was part of the ice dam, one of the ice dams that broke up. And so it was a big, huge, uh, uh, big floating pieces of ice with the rock on it. And then it floated all the way down. And then it lodged up against the edge of the valley here. Uh, and then it melted and it stayed there forever and ever. So it's the largest meteorite ever found in the United States. And all the native people have been uh, worshiping it uh, for many, many years. And you know that because of the material that it's made out of. Yes. It's very easy to tell that it is a, uh, a meteorite. If you look at, at the picture in the book, you can see the hollows and everything like that. You can see where it has been uh, coming in through the atmosphere, uh, caught on fire, and it's all black, uh, et cetera. And so, so it has been verified it is a meteorite. What, what, what is the material? Uh, it is uh, primarily iron meteorite. And so it is from uh, the... Uh, so most of the meteorites that we have on the face of the Earth came from the breakup of a planet that was between Mars and Jupiter. Uh, and, and what happened was it, uh, ex it got too close to Jupiter. The ju gravitational pull of Jupiter just caused it to explode. And all those pieces went into orbit around the sun. Mm -hmm. That's the asteroid belt. And so if we ever send uh, spaceships to go out to Jupiter, you got to pass through the asteroid belt. Yeah. But some of those asteroids have incredibly elliptical orbits. And so they uh, come into the Earth's atmosphere periodically as meteors. And then if they actually hit the earth, then it's meteorite. And mm -hmm. so the meteorite, they're all fragments, mostly of this old uh, planet that blew up towards the beginning of the origin of the solar system. Okay. So a minute ago, you also said that it happened so long ago that you're unable to carbon date it. And you talked about a different way to date things. What, what, what is the drop-off period where carbon doesn't work anymore? It's about, uh, well, <clears throat> traditional way with, with pieces of wood, it's about 50,000. But then we have accelerated de dated where we can take just little tiny pieces of carbon. We can go back to about 70 to 80,000. But beyond that, you cannot do that. It, uh, and so what we do is we have a whole bunch of radioactive elements that are out there, and they break down into lead. They uh, start out as uranium or thorium, and then they will break down into a whole bunch of daughter products. And what you do is you look at how much, uh, you have a sample or a rock, and you compare the amount of lead in it to the amount of uranium or thorium, and you know how much you started out with, and, and then how much is daughter product. And you have the, uh, and, and we know, these are called decay curves. And you compare your decay curves or your percentage of one versus the other, and you have time. And so that's how we use radiometric dating. And we've been doing this ever since the time of Madame Curie, when we started studying radioactive substances. And like so 1850s or so? You no, know, 1900 is when okay. she did a lot of her work. And, and so we can date any rock, especially if it is a volcanic rock uh, or a metamorphic rock. It'll tell when the last metamorphism was. Sedimentary rocks, those are sediments, uh, those are a little harder to date. Well, how do they know how old dinosaur bones are? Uh, well, the dinosaur bones, what we do is we date the particular um, areas around it. Uh, and, and you could also use uranium thorium dating of the dinosaur bones. So wait a minute, wait a minute. They're not actually looking at the bone. They're looking at the rocks around it. No, no. You can do. You can date the rocks around it, but you can also take the bones. Okay. And all of us have uranium and thorium in us uh, uh, and, and, and lead in us, but very, very low percentages. We're talking parts per billion. Uh, and with the dinosaur bones, you can do that too. You can, well, you can date them using the radiometric dating me mechanisms. Okay. And we've been doing that for a long time. So after these floods that ripped through, the Missoula floods, we didn't find any bones? Oh, well, we found lots of bones. Okay. So what, what animals or humans existed when that happened? Well, so um, I live down in Tualatin, and we are going to be having the first uh, uh, Missoula floods or Ice Age flood visitor center here and for the whole Portland area is going to be in Tualatin. Why? Because we have a mastodon that was dug up right there where the floodwaters went in and out. We actually did a video, which you can see at the library, called Tualatin, uh, um, uh, Crossroads of the Ice Age Floods, because the floods came through uh, Lake Oswego, and then they filled up the Tualatin Basin, and then they came back through Tualatin, back into the, the river. There were a lot of animals that were around at that time. 
Uh, and you've got saber-toothed cats. You have got mastodons, mammoths, uh, and then uh, also a giant ground sloths, which when they're standing on their hind feet, 12 feet high. Uh, and, and so uh, one of these mastodons, which is you know, a relative of the elephant, was found in Tualatin when, uh, by a Portland State student. Uh, and, uh, and, and so he dug it up, put the bones together, and then he gave it to Yvonne Addington, who was the city manager of Tualatin. She kept these box, uh, these bones in a box for a long time. Eventually, they mounted it in the library. So Tualatin Library is the only library in the United States with a mastodon in it. Hmm. As you walk in, you can see this half of this mastodon uh, that is there, and we call it Tutu Tuala. Uh, and it's been dated out at about 14,000 years old. So it was just one of the, the last uh, floods that we had there. But we have found other um, mammoths, mastodons, saber-toothed cats, and then a very exciting thing that is out there. We're the beaver state, okay? Uh, and, and, and so we do have a state fossil. Our state fossil is the Dawn Redwood, which uh, the uh, John Day fossil beds have lots of it. And they're very, very distinctive type of leaves that are uh, saved out there. But uh, there is another giant beaver. You know, normal beavers are about this by this. A giant beaver is like this and about five or six feet high. <laughs> Wow. Gigantic. It's kind of Castroides is the uh, genus name of that. And we never have found it in Oregon. Well, four of them have been fi- found by a, uh, a paleontologist, Mike Full, down in the McMinnville area. And so they are now being officially identified. They got to get into the literature. And so down the road, once that they are confirmed as being castroides, we're going to try and get that as the animal fossil of Oregon to go with the plant fossil, which is the Dawn Redwood. Very cool. How, how do you know that it came from Montana? No, it didn't. The, the, uh, the, these are in older deposits. Okay. Yes, uh, that they have found these in. So but- the, is there a way for you to determine that it started somewhere, you know, back in Washington or Idaho or Montana and was swept out here? Yeah, and if it's in a Missoula flood sediment uh, deposit, cut just a couple of years ago, we found uh, an, a very interesting boulder in uh, Lake Ridge, uh, at Lake Oswego, at the west end of Lake Oswego. Right now, they were excavating uh, for the new middle school. And, um, and Skanska, who was, the, uh, who was uh, redoing the school, the superintendent was walking around because when they had to dig out the thing, they had all these boulders. And these were all Missoula flood boulders that had bounced along uh, each one of the floods, all 40 floods coming through there. Uh, there were huge boulders that were just bouncing along uh, on the bottom of the, uh, the, the, the old riverbed. riverbed. And they were all deposited there uh, at this this area where the um, uh, middle school was. And they were all black, 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 black. And then all of a sudden there is this greenish, uh, yellowish boulder. And he said, whoa, what is that? He took a picture of that. And then he went to a website and it identified it as uranotite, which is a, a, a very radioactive boulder. Uh, which in the end it was not. But, uh, and he reported to the uh, principal and they had all these boulders over on the edge of the property. And the principal said, no, we better get a geologist to come in and identify it. They called me, I came in, I said, nah, it looks like it's more of a volcanic rock. And so we identified it. Then Martin Streck, our chair of our department, who's the volcano rock specialist, he said, no, it is, uh, uh, it is a, um, uh, a volcanic type of rock uh, uh, that we call andesite, uh, and uh, and uh, no rhyolite. It's rhyolite, and and so uh, we the principal was very relieved, you know, that uh, it was not uh, uranium bearing. <laughs> yeah, right. And but but what he said, we're going to teach turn this into a teachable moment, and this was during COVID, and the kids were going half day. And so we, I met with all of the students in the middle school at the end of the morning session and then the beginning of the afternoon session. And then they decided to have a, um, uh, an event with the media in the afternoon. 
And so it gave me a chance to explain the origin of Lake Oswego, the two volcanoes that are down there, the, the bedrock that is, is formed on either side. It, or, and, and a lot of students loved it. They had lots of questions. Well, the afternoon, we did this also as the students were coming in. Well, they had so many questions. Well, all the TV stations were there. And the TV stations were more interested in interviewing the students about this, <laughs> this rhyolite, the, the Lake Ridge rhyolite. Uh, and that they, we never had the press conference in the afternoon because all the TV stations were more interested in getting uh, comments from all of the students. Mm -hmm. uh, and then we moved that over to Tualatin where we have a whole bunch of these ice rafted uh, boulders that are there. So, so anytime we've, so um, if we find, uh, you know, the, the sediments or the boulders or the uh, skeletons in Missoula flood sediments, we, we have a way of dating them. Okay. And that's how we do that. So there must be a wealth of information at the bottom of the Columbia and the Willamette and Lake Oswego. Cause I mean, these are probably maybe potentially at one point they were bare and then they've been holding water for thousands yeah, but of they, years. They, they, like the Columbia River, they've been scouring, the water's been scouring down to the bottom. What you need is depositional environments. As a geologist, you never go to the erosional areas. You go to where things are deposited. Uh, That's where you're going to find all of the fossils. That's where you're going to find datable types of things. So what you do is you go to the side valleys uh, off of the Columbia River and off of the Willamette and off in the Walla, Walla Walla Valley, for instance, up in, in Washington. That's where you go to find all these fossils and all of the stories. And Burlingame Canyon, which I was telling you, those 40 different layers that Richard Waite counted up, that was one of those side canyons. That's where the water came in and deposited and all the sediment came out. Mm -hmm. And so there is a huge collection of, of uh, Ice Age mammals uh, that are out there. And, and now we found a large deposit down in Woodburn. David Ellickson, who is the high school teacher down there, you go to his classroom and he's got incredible uh, mammoths, uh, bisons, the largest ancient bison that are there, and all the, everything from very small mammals all the way up to large ones and reptiles. Uh, and, and, and so every year in August, they get the whole community to come out and they dig up another layer in the depositional area and then identify that. And then they, it goes into the collection. Mm -hmm. So there are so many places up and down the Willamette Valley where we could find all of these animals. And so our visitor center that we're going to be opening very, very soon, we're going to have four things. We're going to talk about the Missoula floods, the big picture. Uh, of 16,000 square miles in the Northwest. And then secondly, what's happening in the Portland area? Where did the water come? Where was the erosion? Where was the deposition? What's this relationship to the, the falls in Oregon City, for instance? And, and, then, uh, and then the uh, favorite of uh, Willamette meteorite. Uh, and then thirdly, what were the animals that were living here? So we're going to have all of these skeletons together. And fourthly, who was living here? The native people that were here. And they do have stories about uh, particular flood events that you could uh, row from one side of the Willamette Valley to the other side of the valley. I mean, that's not a normal flood. Those, those are some of the last Missoula floods that we had around 15,000 years ago. Yeah, I don't know if you're a religious man, um, but there are many faiths that have stories of floods. And to me, if you want to believe in religion or your, your specific God, that, that's cool. I don't think anybody can really prove anything, but I think a lot of those stories are natural events that happened that people told other people. Like if you witnessed that, that would that would be the greatest thing you ever saw in your life. And people are gonna talk about that for thousands of years. Whoever survived it is gonna tell the story of the great flood and then that gets incorporated into religion. At least that's my opinion. And, and I think we have evidence for the, the great flood um, uh, that is mentioned in the Old Testament with, with Noah. Mm -hmm. And Bob Ballard, one of the world's greatest oceanographers, has actually studied it. If you go to the Black Sea, um, uh, which is, was, was uh, flooded, we believe, um, and uh, we believe that uh, the whole Mediterranean Sea, for instance, uh, was completely cut off uh, from the rest of the oceans of the world because Africa is pushing into Europe. And where the Rock of Gibraltar was, is uh, that was part of a large dam that completely 
stop the water f- coming in from the Atlantic Ocean into the Mediterranean Sea. We have, a, we've cored the Mediterranean Sea and there is a la- huge thick layer of salt all over. And, and we've well dated it from the rocks above and rocks above uh, below. Uh, and we know exactly when that dam was there that completely uh, um, caused the Mediterranean Sea to dry up. Then eventually that broke and the whole thing came in. All of the water was lowered probably 50 to 80 feet. Uh, The whole world, all that water came in and filled up not only the Mediterranean Sea, but the Black Sea area. And Bob Ballard has in uh, the uh, uh, Black Sea has villages, huge number of villages uh, that were back uh, uh, in there uh, that were inundated by this huge flood. And, sure. and he's taken the bath, uh, bathscopes down there and, and looked at all of those, and they're well dated. And, and so that's one flood that probably was the flood that we find in the Old Testament uh, mm-hmm. that was there, and it, it, it was real. So, Are there any scenarios that you see now in what you study? And there's a lot of talk of um, icebergs melting and, and the the great ice sheet uh, up north and below uh, in the south in melting. Antarctica, yep. yep. Are there any spots that you have seen or that any of your peers have seen that could produce something like this? Um, so again, all of the biggest floods that we have ever uh, seen are from uh, ice dams that have collapsed. Uh, Iceland periodically will have huge ice dams that are there, huge lakes that are formed, and then th- that water will just come rushing out. They call them Jokalalps, and uh, they're much smaller ones than these mega uh, floods. But now what we are finding all over the world are evidences of these mega floods from the past. But most of them are in the, uh, the, the last three million years uh, when we have had the ice dams that are out there. Uh, and And so... Uh, so right now what's happening is, uh, as the climate is warming, what's happening, we're melting all of the glaciers. And and we're seeing incredible m- melting up in Greenland and up in the Arctic. I mean, boats are going to be able to go uh, from Europe to the West Coast and from China to Europe instead of through the Suez Canal and instead of around the Horn or, uh, or, or the Panama Canal. I mean, that's going to be a major travel way for the, uh, because the you're not going to get the sea ice that is up there all of the time. Uh, and what's, ha- and, and so we, we, those are, <laughs> we're cataloging all those glaciers there and they're, uh, they're melting at a very, very rapid rate. And especially over in Greenland. And then you go down to Antarctica. We, we used to be just looking at the snout of the glacier. Uh, and then as it moves back up, then uh, you're saying, oh, that's less mass. What we're now, a lot of those are ice sheets that are floating. We're seeing that the melting is really occurring at the bottom and that the amount of melting is much faster than we have thought in the past. And the, the climate is warming. I mean, that's a fact that is out there. And we're melting the, uh, and we're going to see sea level rise. Mm-hmm. And, uh, and it's going to be affecting a lot of these island nations that are out there and people along the coasts. Florida, Oregon, Washington, and California coast too. So um, we're seeing this happening. Now, will we have catastrophic types of floods? Probably not because everything is melting and you need to have advancing glaciers to kind of stop up, uh, uh, create uh, ice dams that will have large lakes. So you're saying there's no stoppers anywhere that are... No, we aren't seeing any right now. Most of these uh, large ice dams failing in the past were were when the glaciers were advancing Mm -hmm. instead of retreating. Mm Mm-hmm. And so is there still a lake up in the Missoula area or is it completely dry? Oh no, there there is a, there is there is it's a river, river valley that is there right now. But there was at one time. Yeah. A lake there. Yeah, so I just picture driving through the gorge. And so is it safe for people listening right now to assume the water was at the top? You can see in the gorge, and, and the Dalles is just a wonderful place because we take students on field trips from Portland State up there, uh, especially as you uh, go to the east of the Dalles. Mm-hmm. Uh, and you, you'll see right next to the river is, is uh, the 
Columbia River basalt, which is the bedrock, is exposed. And then you go up the slopes, and then it is primarily fine-grained, what we call silt soils uh, that are eroded away. And then you will go up, and then you'll see a point where they have been eroded away too. And then up above, then it's nice and smooth. So as you come down, smooth slope has not been eroded, but then when you see the indentation, that is from the Missoula floods. And then the lower part was all eroded away, all that silt that was on there before is now gone. And so you can, you, uh, and Jay Harlan Bretz, the guy that put together the story, came down to Columbia. He said, ah, there, th- this Spokane flood came this high. Uh, and and he, he saw that. And and, and so the, the data is out, are out there. And now we believe there are 40 floods that made it down here and 89 plus floods that made it to the Spokane area. And then we probably had X number of floods throughout the last 2.8 million years, what we call the Quaternary. Why do you think they were so skeptical of what he was proposing? Isn't science supposed to be about newfound discoveries? Yeah, it is. And now and now we we believe in that. But in those days, they when they put together the early Scots did when they put the invented geology and describing the rocks, they had a whole bunch of tenets that they put together. And uniformitarianism, they said no, uh, everything is sl- uh, formed slowly and not catastrophically over a long time. Long time. We now know that they were wrong, but it took until this incredible event uh, and the Missoula floods for people to realize. Now, we have volcanic eruptions today, and people see that those are catastrophic type of events. And people say, oh, well, that doesn't quite count for this uniformitarianism. Uh, they were talking more about floods and landslides and things like that. But then, uh, no, we can have catastrophic mega floods because nobody had seen, humans had not seen except the the native peoples, um, these catastrophic events before. I just don't understand why you wouldn't consider it a possibility. Everybody knows what water is. Everybody knows what a flood is. I don't know why you would just totally disregard somebody. You think they just didn't want to that question? Was the the think, they... thinking of the day. And, and so just, we don't know. Huh. Yeah, whenever I hear stories about that, it always makes me think, what do we think today? That there's some guy with a crazy idea and he's he's getting disregarded and ostracized because he's got some fringe idea. That's, a lot of those fringe ideas eventually become mainstream. They can, yeah. It. I don't know. That's what's so cool about science is it. you can never really fully trust that whatever you think is true is really true because somebody exactly. can come along and prove it wrong. That's right. And so we tell our students, and, and this is one of the best stories that is out there to tell all geology students, uh, that uh, we went, uh, J. Harlan Brents went against the thinking of the day. But it took from 1922 to really 1940 uh, for people to come forward to say, Brents is right. Mm-hmm. Uh, and then eventually, then it got into the textbooks, and now it's in every textbook. Mm-hmm. Uh, but it is a great story that was out here, and that's where our thinking was in, in the past. Mm-hmm. So we we as we learn new things, uh, we put together new theories and new hypotheses and things of like that. And so we are always changing, yeah. and that's important. Mm-hmm. Do you know who Ignaz Zemmelweis is? No, you have to tell me. I'm going to forget some of the details, but I'll try to I'll try to be complete. Uh, he was a um, he uh, he was a doctor in the mid 1800s, and he would work at two different hospitals, and they had significant issues with uh, the the mothers dying after childbirth, and the doctors would work at the morgue on dead, decomposing bodies, and then go to the other hospital and deliver the babies. Oh, geez. And so they, they weren't washing their hands, you know, or, or using any sort of um, cleaner. And so he started making connections between the two, and he said, hey, I don't think uh, working on a decomposing body and then going and delivering a baby is good for anybody. And they... They called him crazy, and he st- he somehow figured out he, – he was on the cusp of germ theory and discovered that they needed to wash their hands. And he did all these tests and, you know, compared data with the, the doctors who were washing their hands and the doctors who weren't, and they – did not want to believe that they were doing anything wrong and they wouldn't accept what he said. And then he ended up dying um, 
in, I think he went to an insane asylum yeah. and he died. And then, uh, you know, 10, 15 years later, I believe it was Lipton, Liston, I forget. There was a different doctor who came along and proposed basically what Ignaz Semmelweis was saying and kind of turned it into that. And now everybody washes their hands. because yes. And we found all those things about. Yeah. The small bugs that mm-hmm. are out there. Yep. Yeah. So we are at a very interesting time period where we understand so much, so much more than we used to. I mean, the, the, uh, the instruments and utensils and data that you get to use now versus what someone in your field used a hundred years ago is insane. You get to understand so much more than they did. It's amazing. Uh, and, and so one of my other areas of research that I do is landslides. And so we now have drones that we can go out and take measurements uh, and, and, and put together a story on landslides using that. We have laser range finders. We, we can measure the distance between here and there and get the exact sizes of these landslides without having to take a tape measure across or have somebody go out a, into the middle of a landslide, uh, things like that. And then when we go in and do all of our modeling, all of our mathematical models and our computers and uh, things of that nature, wow. What we can do today compared to what we could do 30, 40, 50 years ago is amazing. And that's just only in my area of of geology. There are many other areas in geology and and in science. And it's just, it's wonderful. Uh, We keep getting new tools to work with, new computers. uh, and, uh, And so what we are coming up with is just amazing. And speed. I mean, when I, was, when I did my first master's degree, which was in biochemistry, um, it was at the Stanford Medical School. And my biochem class, I had 11 Nobel Prize winners as professors by the time I finished. One guy actually had two. And, uh, and they were talking about this future thing of gene sequencing. Well, shoot, now we have a virus come out the next week. They can gene sequence it. They put it together. They chop off uh, uh, a part of the messenger RNA, and that becomes the the new vaccine that you've got. I mean, it, it's very, very fast today. Back in the 1960s and 70s, it was just theoretical where mm-hmm. we were. And, uh, I mean, Watson and Crick, when they put together the whole thing of DNA and RNA, that was only the 1950s. It wasn't that very long ago. Mm-hmm. And so we keep building uh, on the, 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 the database of all science, all areas of science, on the shoulders of the, the earlier scientists. And we just keep finding newer and newer nice things. So is it necessary for you to still go out in the field and dig and, and physically see things? Or can you do it all with aerial uh, photography. No, it, I'm still one of those guys. I'd love to go out in the field and d- dig the soils because every soil pit that you d- dig, there's a story there, and you want it and for that particular locale that you have got. And and so it's always nice to see those things here in the Northwest. For instance, uh, I, I go to uh, the east side of the mountains. You dig down, and all of a sudden you see a nice white layer. Well, that tells you that that it was probably volcanic ash from one of the volcanoes. And so everything that is deposited on top of that is younger. So if I just take a sample of that, send it off to Washington State to the special lab there, they'll send it back. Oh, so the, uh, they'll say, well, that's Mount St. Helens, S. Ash, and that's 14,000 years old. And so you, you have something to date things. Mm-hmm. And so you could, so as we get out and explore new places, all around Oregon, Washington, and the Pacific Northwest. Um, and, and by digging down, we we find new stories that are out there, and we try and put things together. And then sometimes we are lucky and we find fossils. And then you got to put together the fossils. Then if you get old enough and, and, and into some of the rocks, you find you can put additional uh, ideas together about how life has changed over many, many years. So uh, um, science is exciting. Because we have new tools, we have new ways of thinking about things, and then wherever we go, there are new discoveries to be made and fun to, to do all of So that. what area do you enjoy going to the most? You mean uh, geographically? Yeah. Well, everyone, you know, matter where I go in the world, there's a story. And that's what I love, being a geologist. I was president of one of the four international geology societies from 2014 to 2018. And I got to tra- travel the whole country, uh, the whole world. I did 14 keynotes in 12 countries. And every place I would go to, 
I would get off and I could start putting the other story. So there's a landslide over here. There, the, this is an area that ha has this particular type of soil. It might be good for growing grapes or growing something else. Uh, and then you then you meet with the local people and you learn about all of the geology and the past history and natural history. Uh, it, it's wonderful. So wherever you go in the world, there is a story. Mother Nature is shouting out to you. And that's one of my aims in life is to get students to take my classes and to learn how to read the environment. How do you talk with Mother Nature and, and put these stories together? Because it is fun. We've been talking about the Missoula floods. That's one of many, many stories that we have here in, in the, in the Portland-Washington, uh, uh, Oregon area. And, uh, and it's exciting as we put more and more things together. Well, yeah, that, that gets in line with uh, the fact that we have so many vineyards in this area. Do you think that any part of those floods made it more uh, prime for, for growing grapes? So part of my book on the Missoula floods is about wines and the Missoula floods. I didn't get that part yet. <laughs> yeah. And, and so, in fact, next week I'll be giving a talk on this. And, and, and so the quality of wines in the Pacific Northwest related to the Ice Age floods. Here in the so when you grow grapes, you want to stress the grapes. You want to have low nutrient soils. You don't fertilize. Uh, and so therefore, uh, when the grape plant comes back to life, it says there's just no nutrients here. There's no water. I got to put all my energy into the grapes and that, uh, and not leaves and stems. And therefore you make quality grapes for quality wines. And so here in the Willamette Valley, we have the Willamette, uh, silts that were deposited here from the Missoula floods. And they go from Portland all the way down to Eugene. They are about 70 feet thick here at Newburgh. And then as you get down to Eugene, it's only about five to 10 feet thick. And that is the great soil that we have in the Willamette Valley. It is absolutely wonderful for growing grass seed and, and hazelnuts or what in the old days we used to call filberts. And, uh, uh, and that's why all of the people came here on the covered wagons because they heard about the incredible fertile soils of the valley. But if you grow grapes, you go above the Missoula flood sediments over 250 feet in elevation. That's where the soils are red. And the rule of thumb in making a soil a wines is the redder the soil, the better. Red means well-drained, which you want to have. And secondly, it means old soils. You want to have old soils, which mean low nu nutrient soils. It'll stress the grapes. And that's why we make incredible wines here in the Willamette Valley. You stay above the Missoula floods, but you go to Washington, 95% of all of the vineyards that the, you have out there are on Missoula flood sediments or the windblown silt off of them that we call Lus. Uh, and, you, and you say, well, wait a second. You just said that you want to stay off the Missoula floods. Well, all of eastern Washington is very hot, and so they have to irrigate. And so you limit the growth by giving just enough water to keep the plant alive. Hmm. You don't, uh, you don't, you can have nutrient rich soils, but you limit it through the water. And so 95% of all of the vineyards in eastern Washington, which makes great heavy reds and best Syrahs in the United States, states, they're grown out there. They limit the um, uh, vigor by water. Here in the Willamette Valley, we limit it by soils. Hmm. And so the, there's a huge relationship between the Missoula floods and the, the grapes and the wines. And in the United States, Washington is number two in the number of wineries and wine production, and Oregon is number three in the number of uh, wineries per state. Behind California. California. Yeah. The biggie. And so what's up with Napa Valley? Why is that so? Well, so uh, Napa Valley uh, is, is, has established itself, especially for the heavy reds, the Cabs and Berlows and Syrahs and Zinfandels. The problem is um, uh, Greg Jones, who's the world's greatest wine climatologist who lives here in Oregon, uh, and he and I generally do a lot of terroir talks together. He'll do the, the climate, I'll do the soils. Uh, and he says within 20 years about the only uh, plant that they will be growing in the Napa Valley will be Zinfandel, which is hot, hot climate. All of the uh, Pinot Noirs, Pinot Gris, the Cabs, Merlots, and Syrahs, it'll be too warm for them. And the climate will have grown to a point that they just, they're only going to be able to grow Zinfandels, maybe little Nebbiola and a couple of other ones. And so as the climate moves, uh, you just, you, you move the different types of grapes. Here in the Willamette Valley, we're cool climate. But now at the lowest elevations, all the winemakers are growing Tempranillo and, uh, and cool climate uh, uh, Syrah. 
and they're ripening, and they are be they're we're we're uh, they're producing some very very good wines. Why? Because uh, the climate is warming, and and, and so what's going to happen with time? We have the whole range of all of the soils, uh, the grapes that we can go to as the climate warms up. We just go to the next Cab mm. Merlot and Syrah, and then Zinfandel will be the last one. Hmm. Well, wouldn't drought be a good thing then? Because it stresses the grapes? Well, uh, but uh, you still need to have a little bit of uh, water there to irrigate. Yeah. Uh, and so you don't, you keep, an, you want to keep that plant alive because drought does stress. And, and so here in the Willamette Valley where we don't irrigate, um, it, it, when those times that we do have a lot of uh, drought, uh, some of the plants don't make it through because we don't irrigate. Now, some of the vineyards still keep their um, their irrigation systems in from the early days when they planted because the first three years, they a lot of times will irrigate, uh, especially August and September when we don't get rain. Mm -hmm. But so those are out there. And so the, the stress allows them to be sweeter? Is that the goal? No, no. The object is to get, well, you want to have uh, a sugar. And so you, when you pick a grape, uh, the winemaker and the vineyard manager, you want to have 23 to 25% sugar in the grape, okay? And, th and that makes a beautiful, well-balanced wine. They call it 23 to 25 bricks. That's how they they, they call that. Uh, but if you leave the grape on the vine uh, uh, for a long time, you may get up to 28, 29%. Well, uh, a, a 23 to 25% Sugar will generally give you 12 to 13 uh, percent sugar alcohol. alcohol. Yeah. Okay. That's a well balanced wine. If you look at a lot of the wines coming out of California, they're 15, 16 percent alcohol. Why? Because uh, it's so warm down there. Mm -hmm. uh, because when you pick the grapes, you want to have that 23 to 25 percent bricks, but you want your grape seeds to go from uh, green to brown. That means they you have the complexity for the wine. Uh, and uh, if you, but with it being so hot today, the, you get the percentage uh, sugar out there early, but the complexity isn't there because those grape seeds are still green. And so they, they, the guys keep going out in the field, looking at the grapes, looking at the grapes. Once it's brown, then they do it. Well, then they're dealing with uh, 29, 30% sugar, uh, which ends up with 15, 16% alcohol. Hmm. I mean, and that's not a well-balanced wine that you've got. Get you drunker. That's right. Well, <laughs> and, and a few years ago, one of those years that we had very, very warm uh, temperatures, I mean, they sold out because, whoa, this is good wine. Mm -hmm. But uh, for the really good wine drinkers, they, they, they look at that balance that is out there. Mm -hmm. Yeah, it's fascinating. Uh, growing up in the Dalles, everybody grows cherries. Yes. And there is a, a very short window when things can go sideways. And if it rains it can cause the cherries to split yep. and it can ruin the, the entire crop. And so I I wanted to get somebody I know down here to come talk to me because I don't know it, the exact details, but I've heard that they've rented helicopters before to fly over the crop and blow the water off of it. Because yeah, if, if uh, the second week of June, if it rains and then the next morning the sun comes out, it'll split all the cherries, yep. which then your yield is lower which makes them more expensive. So it's this weird economic yeah, yeah. dichotomy because if you have a really good crop, you have a ton, which means that you charge a lower price. If the crop gets screwed up, you have to charge higher, but you don't have as many. So all this stuff is so intertwined with nature and what you're talking about with the soil and the, the, the types of irrigation, if you're, it's necessary, it's all intertwined with itself. And because we rely so much on all of it, it's like a it's like a science. It's not just oh we're gonna grow some grapes this year or we're gonna grow some cherries and we'll eat them later. It's like directly tied to profit and year year over year growth and all this stuff. So people, all those people down in those vineyards, they're like studying this stuff intensely to make yep. sure they get the right yield. Yeah, and then then also with the vineyards, they have to worry about early season frosts and late season frosts. And so you go down to the Illinois Valley, down near Cave Junction in Oregon, and you, all of these vineyards have these huge, uh, um, huge uh, fans, mm -hmm. uh, basically um, airplane engines that are out there, and they're trying to break up all of the the the, the uh, 
freezing layers that would mm-hmm. form uh, because they, the, the frost is not good for the blooms that are coming out in the springs and then in the fall before they are fully ripened to that 23, 25 bricks that mm-hmm. they've got. The, most of the Willamette Valley here is not a big problem and up the gorge is not a big problem. Uh, but uh, Illinois Valley is one of those they really have to worry about that. Mm-hmm. Yeah. I mean, everything's just gradually moving up. I, I I imagine people in like British Columbia are starting to think about what they're going to grow in 30, they, 40 years. They, no, they're already... Uh, Okanagan is a huge grape growing area, but they're also growing them out on uh, Vancouver Island. Mm-hmm. And then the whole same, th- same thing's happening in Europe. I mean, Germany used to be all white wines and, and, and the uh, Rieslings, Gewürztraminers, Mueller, Turgaus. Now they're getting into the red wines uh, and the uh, uh, Pinot Noir, just like us. But Scandinavia, uh, Denmark now has 28 wineries. Sweden has uh, 36 and Norway has 29 or something like that. Uh, they never had any grapes up there, but now because it is warming up, they can grow white wines. And then the Champagne area of northern France, it's too warm to grow the grapes for the Champagne. They know that. And so they have bought all of this property in England, which is on limestone bedrock. You got to have the limestone bedrock. Uh, and they are within five years, all of the Champagne grapes are going to be grown in England, not in Champagne because it's warming up. Hmm. And, and, and so we're finding all over the world as, as it warms up, you just move the, the zones of wineries. Here in the United States, every state has a winery in it now, even hmm. Alaska. Uh, and, and then even Vermont. I, I lectured at one of the, the ones in Ver, one of the four wineries in Vermont. I mean, because it's warm enough, everything's warming up. In some areas, it's too warm. Yeah. So what's your opinion on that? You think any of it is tameable? Or, or irreversible, or you think it's just where we're going? I, I'm, a, I'm still a firm believer that we can turn things around, but we are burning so many fossil fuels, uh, and, and, and the amount of carbon dioxide going into the atmosphere, the gr- greenhouse effect is there, uh, and we need to turn that around, but people won't do that. Yeah. They just will not change the vehicles that they are, are driving. Uh, now, a lot of our power companies are changing. And they are changing things around. That's good. I think uh, with time, we'll be heading more towards nuclear power because we've under- we understand uh, what's, uh, what's out there and it is not going to be polluting the atmosphere as you're burning your fossil fuels. The problem is there, we got to get a place to put the spent nuclear fuel- fuels. Mm-hmm. I mean, Yucca Mountain in Africa, uh, not Africa, in Nevada is a beautiful place. It was well studied by geologists and is a great place to put all these spent fuels. But but the people in Re- uh, uh, in uh, Las Vegas say, "Not in my backyard." You- well, yeah, Americans are terrified of nuclear power, are they not? Because of Three Mile Island. And- yeah, but that's all in the past, and we under we've taken care of all of that, uh, 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 all of the problems that went into the engineering and, and what happened. A new, uh, I mean, we uh, that was early in the game of nuclear power, mm-hmm. and we didn't know how to do that. But you you go to countries like the Philippines that has like eighty nuclear reactors, uh, and and Japan has got a lot of them, mm-hmm. and and, and uh, the number one company in the world uh, is um, shoot, it's an American Westinghouse making uh, nuclear powers. They huh. got it down pat. They, they know the pros and the cons of what you can do and can't do. So we just got to find a place to put the new spent fuel. We have it, but people don't want it there. Well, what happens when you fill up a hole in Nevada with all that waste? Well, there, there are lots of, you can b- dig uh, big holes next door. Yucca Mountain is, uh, it, it, the amount of storage that is there is huge. Hmm. So, so we'll see what will happen in that particular area. I'll we'll give you another area to study. <laughs> That's right. Well, yeah, there are, I mean, there's so many, so many different areas that we can study. Wow. That was fantastic. You are uh, a wealth of knowledge and appreciate you. Well, I appreciate you saying that. Thank you for the invitation. Yeah. You get a ta- chance to talk about one of my very interesting things that I love, the the, the Ice Age floods, Missoula floods. I mean, it's good. We got into wine, which is another one of the hats that I wear. I'm the terroirist here in Oregon, trying to turn everybody into a terroirist and mm-hmm. know that there are different flavors related to the soils. And and so so thank you. 
And yeah. thanks for what you're doing. Like, like I said, when you showed up, I love sitting down and talking to people who are much smarter than me on very specific subjects. And yeah, that's fantastic. Thank you. Well, thank you for the invitation. Yep. Keep up the good work. Thank you.